I wasn't kidding when I said that I loved Iranian food. And this Persian restaurant in Encino is known for its salmon kebab, which is not only well marinated and juicy, but is crispy on the outside from the fire. I wish I knew exactly how they made it. That said, today's fish got me thinking about trout and how a man named Victor Schauberger raised a simple and profound issue when he wondered how does a trout manage to stay still in a fast flowing river. To help illustrate what I'm talking about, this is a lab video from the University of Florida of a dead trout in a tank of still water, which when flowing, you can see the trout start to move, not swim on its own, but the fish is being swum, so to speak, not on its own effort. There's no muscle derived thrust, yet the body of the fish is being propelled forward. Schauberger observed that the occasional gentle sway of its tail is all that's needed to maintain its position in the flowing water. Not only that, they are very proficient at swimming upstream against the current. If one stops and thinks for a while, this is a really remarkable swimming accomplishment. And the trout's secret seems to be fluid flow dynamics and vortex theory. In other words, like how water flows down a drain or a tornado, vortices form behind stationary objects in flowing water. And due to the shape of the trout, the vortices start to form along the rear of its body. And Victor Schauberger explains that the pressure of the vortices push the trout upstream. And by opening its gills, the trout can increase the intensity of the vortices it generates and stay almost stationary. Of course, the dead trout that we observed doesn't have this control, so we just see it thrusting around. Of course, there's more to it than vortices when the trout is jumping out of the water or abruptly giving bursts of movement. But Schauberger was mainly interested in its ability to stay stationary and applied this to aerodynamics, developing his own ideas based on what he observed in nature. In Implosion magazine, a magazine released by Schauberger's family, he said that aeronautical and marine engineers had incorrectly designed the propeller, stating that, quote, as best demonstrated by nature in the case of the aerofoil maple seed, today's propeller is a pressure screw and therefore a braking screw, whose purpose is to allow the heavy maple seed to fall parachute-like slowly towards the ground and to be carried away sideways by the wind in the process. No bird has such a whirling thing on its head, nor a fish on its tail. Only man made use of this natural brake screw for forward propulsion. As the propeller rotates, so does the resistance rise by the square of the rotational velocity. This is also a sign that this supposed propulsion device is unnaturally constructed and therefore out of place. Victor Schauberger was born in Austria and was a naturally gifted inventor that developed a great love of nature. After becoming a forest ranger, he invented the log flume, an artificial brook that reduced transportation costs for lumber to one-tenth of the original sum. In a totally unique way, he succeeded to float heavy logs thicker than two foot on a thin layer of about a foot of imploded water. From his visions, he learned that water recharges itself with a natural magnetism through meandering, which means following a winding course or swirling. This magnetic-like power contracts the water molecules, causing them to densify and have greater carrying power. This device was successful and his further research caught the attention of Hitler, who invited him to meet in 1934 and gave him considerable resources to develop alternative implosion-based technology, such as a device for natural heat and cold, and eventually the suction screw for what some call a, quote, flying submarine. While much of his work was for the SS, 
and labeled top secret, the Americans did not seem very interested and did not utilize them during Operation Paperclip, where many German scientists continued their research in the U.S., and he was instead released by promising to cease all work on implosion techniques. Although Schoberger's work was innovative and groundbreaking in many respects, I do not share the same opinion that many have regarding his contribution to the alleged German flying saucer technology. While he is given credit on almost every documentary I've seen on the subject of German UFOs, the Vril and Hanabu craft were based on a different type of anti-gravitic technology that may have had parallels to his work on vortex fields. I just think he was a very intuitive inventor and the disc craft were based on pre-existing technology, which some speculate already existed, as documented in some ancient Aryan texts from India, where flying vehicles called Vimanas are described in detail, and through metaphysical research conducted by German occult organizations, such as the one headed by the medium Maria Orsich, who was said to have channeled information that led to the anti-gravitic prototypes. One researcher who spent much of the 1990s meeting with members of German secret societies, as well as the children of German scientists who allegedly worked on advanced propulsion technology and free energy devices, was Vladimir Terzinski, a Bulgarian-born engineer and physicist who simply vanished around the time of the 9-11 incident in 2001. While Terzinski's conclusions seem rather far-fetched among many of today's modern researchers, he was very meticulous and did a lot of legwork meeting with the actual people involved or immediate family members and did not embellish what he found but faithfully reported on the claims that not only did Germans make it first into space but this included bases on the moon and Mars with the outrageous claim that they had help from, quote, people from other worlds. He was not pro-German nationalist in terms of political ideology, so he was not aligned with Nazis in any way, yet he was honest about their technological achievements and keenly aware of the post-war effort to cover up some of these breakthroughs, especially in terms of physics. That said, I'd like to play a short clip where he interviews the daughter of an Operation Paperclip scientist, and I was shocked to find this clip no longer available online, and believe his work must remain part of the public discourse, regardless of it being poor video quality and riddled with audio problems. So that said, let's have a listen. The story is that the Germans that dug under the South Pole and built their underground bases before the Second World War ended and that beat the hell out of Admiral Byrd's naval campaign against them in uh, the winter of 46, the spring of 46, when actually in two weeks they downed most of his planes and he retreated in disgrace. Uh, this huge German colony there, they moved hundreds of thousands of people before the war ended. By now, I've heard rumors that this is... This was a very mysterious buzz that appeared only over this portion of the tape inexplicably why. So now I am basically repeating the story of the German underground South Polar colony. Um, the wildest stories are that there is a city called New Berlin that has two million inhabitants uh, the center of the German colony there uh, this is what has been developed after the hundreds of thousands of people were moved during the Second World War the G German elite basically lost the European war in order to win the uh, South Polar War uh, in secretly preparing for two years for the uh, awaited American attack and when it came they beat uh, Admiral Byrd in just two weeks with their way more superior technology that they had there. 
Uh, they've been engaged primarily in space exploration, uh, flights in the solar system and beyond, and genetic uh, experiments to create a new super race, a new master race, uh, to create the, the, their dreamed supermensch. Uh, I've uh, discovered witnesses that have seen German documentary films from the World War II concentration camps of um, horrific genetic experiments uh, and uh, in this large city that they have there underground, the city fittingly called New Berlin, they've been uh, basically evolving the new super race that is quite more advanced and has very little in common with the race that lives on the other part of the planet. It's my uh, intuitive feeling that um, the tall blonde aliens, the Nordic type aliens that have been observed in many little grey abduction scenarios, they could as well be Germans coming from their South Polar colony <coughs> that are doing research together with our government in uh, genetic experiment <coughs> genetic experiments uh, primarily uh, on the American population in order to create a white Nordic type race uh, this is my deepest suspicion and this is one of the biggest secrets of the intelligence community these days uh, so I don't know this buzz that appeared on the tape could have been accidental or it could have been just on the most sensitive place of the whole tape so my question is do you remain with an impression that he may mm, he may have been talking about a hollow moon with major installations inside or it was just a dugout tunnel and underground base underground city type of a thing that the earth government ha have done on the moon I kept thinking, you know, when he said under the surface, I couldn't imagine what in the world would be under the surface. Oh, he says there's plenty of room. That seems like there was plenty of room, but I don't remember him saying anything in particular that it was hollow. He says yeah. plenty of room. Now, about the marsh, about his Martian trips, did he elaborate? Uh, about being on the surface of Mars and inside Mars? Yeah, he talked about it in the same breath with the moon. Yeah. And he says there were several of us that have gone up. I said, did you have to really be something special to be chosen? He says, we're all special. <laughs> you know? We were all special. Uh, did he mention how they went there? How they Did they go there by rocket? by a spaceship, by, by, by a flying saucer, I'm sorry, by or by some teleportation te technology? Well, at the time, the way he explained to me, it was incomprehensible for, it didn't seem to be a, a mechanical way of going from point A to point B. He says it's incomprehensible. So this is basically a teleportation explanation that a, 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 a material object in point A is turned into beam of light and transport it to point B where it is materialized. I just thought of something and the first thing I said, and I was very liberated, I said, are there women up there too? He says, of course. You were probably asking about earth women. Yes, earth women, yeah. Which means that there are families and there are children being born there and it's a full-fledged colony, it's a survival civilization already established on the moon and Mars or at least women scientists or uh, whatever they did, you know. I'm sure they didn't have women up there just to serve them coffee, <laughs> like they do in the offices here. <laughs> Marina would love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that the government has established such uh, stations, uh, this is all done, this was done with Tesla technology, probably since the early 50s or 60s. So, did he mention anything about the surface civilization living on Mars, an alien civilization living on Mars? He seemed to feel, uh, he, he used the analogy between, you know, the moon and Mars in, within the same sentence structure, as if they were simultaneously together the same bag of tricks at the same time. Yeah, because with such 
planet to planet uh, teleportation technology uh, whether you go to the moon or, or to to pl pluton pluto or neptune basically it's the same business it's done in a second in a split second probably uh, now, uh, to the underground of Mars, it's very interesting because Al Bilic, uh, he was talking of him and his brother, Duncan, going to Mars, inside Mars, into huge underground uh, shelters, underground uh, doomsday shelters that were built by previous Martian civilization, now extinct and no more existing. While such talk of underground Martian and moon bases seems almost comical today to most people, it is not a joke to all people. For example, the former head of Israel's Defense Ministry's space program for several decades, Haim Eshed, who recently said, quote, There's an agreement between the U.S. government and the aliens. They signed a contract. And that there was a, quote, underground base in the depths of Mars. So this is from mm -hmm. the former head of Israel's space program, Haim Ashed, who says that aliens have been in contact with the U.S. and with Israel. Um, what does he refer to? The Galactic Federation, Galactic Federation that he says has you know, been in touch with Israel and the U.S. He also says that Donald Trump was going to reveal yes. their existence, the but verge. then basically got talked out of it, I suppose. Yeah, and look, he's 87 years old. Uh, according to him, he says he has nothing to lose. He's a decorated former Israeli general, former space security chief. He's been awarded a medal three separate times, two secretly, for actions that kept Israel safe. Clearly somebody who was regarded well by that government. Now, what he's saying is kind of crazy. Uh, he <laughs> says that the cooperation of, there's a secret pact between the U.S. government and the Galactic Federation, that the cooperation includes a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. He claims that the United States already has military personnel in underground bases on Mars. Well, this is quite a story, and it comes from the man who headed Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years, Chaim Eshed, is making the extraordinary claim that the United States and Israel have been in contact with a group of aliens for years, not immigrants, but extraterrestrials. He has called them the Galactic Federation of Aliens, and he says President Trump is aware of the existence of these aliens and had been on the verge of revealing their secrets, he claims, but was asked not to do so by the Federation in order to prevent what he calls mass hysteria. Well, the retired general says the U.S. and Israel have kept it from the public because, quotes, humanity isn't ready and the aliens don't want to reveal themselves until humanity can evolve, he says, and understand what space really is. Well, the good news is that he claims an agreement has been reached between the U.S. government and the aliens, a contract to do experiments here. There's also, he says, a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. Now, this former head of a branch of Israel's defense ministry is 87. He was very well respected. He says he's come forward now in the hope that his news will be accepted as true. He notes that if he'd made these claims five years ago, he would have been hospitalized. But now he says, I've got nothing to lose. Well, so far, President Trump has not tweeted about this. Though, remember, a year ago, he did set up the Space Force as the fifth branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Well, we did ask the White House, the Department of Defense, and Israeli officials to comment. So far, they have not responded to the NBC News request, and I wonder if they ever will. Before you leave office, will you let us know if there's aliens? Because this is the only thing I really want to know. I, I want to know what's going on. Would you ever open up Roswell and let us know what's really going on there? So many people ask me that question. I know, yes. it sounds almost ridiculous, no, it but it's actually it sounds, the real question I want like to know. It sounds like a cute question, but it's actually, there are millions and millions of people that want to go there, that want to see it. I won't talk to you about what I know about it, but it's very interesting. But Roswell's a very interesting place with a lot of people that would like to know what's going on. So you're saying you may declassify? Oh. You'll, you'll, you'll take it? Well, I'll, I, I'll have to think about that one, right? Uh, I'll have well, to think. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. 
The topic of German blood brings us back to the legend of the German Vril Society and a meeting held in 1919 at an old hunting lodge in Germany where Maria Orsic presented to a small group assembled from the Thule, Vril, and Black Sun societies telepathic messages she claimed to have received from a likely extraterrestrial human civilization that claimed to be genetically related existing in the distant Aldebaran solar system 68 light years away in the constellation of Taurus near the Pleiades. One set of Maria's channel transmissions was found to be in a secret German Templar script unknown to her. The late researcher Wendell Stevens tells us that rather than a militant gesture of aid to nationalist Germans, the Aldebaran's contact had to do with free energy and a peaceful attempt at helping Earth humanity with less destructive technology which we were using for war, pollution, and control. The aliens or space Aryans reasoned that by offering free energy tech used to create affordable mass transportation devices and a new innovative generation of industries that promoting prosperity and greater peaceful interaction between nations might result, thus diminishing violent wars, pollution, and spiritual degradation. Clearly, such a plan resonated with members of both the Thule and Vril societies and their dream for a clean and free technology based on this alternative science harnessing Vril energy. Members of the Vril society believe that Aldebaran Aryans landed on Earth following global cataclysms in antiquity, and when the planet became slowly habitable again, re-established civilization where they formed the dominant ruling nobility of various other early societies governing through an elite bloodline and segregated caste system. Mixing blood was strictly taboo. It became the greatest secret of mankind. It started ufology as we know it today. Indeed, there is a second humanity, an inner terrestrial race who had already built cities in the inner earth before the sinking of Atlantis. What was it that Admiral Byrd found on the South Pole? Incredibly enough, in an official American Navy documentary film, we found footage of what Admiral Byrd found on the South Pole. He found giant freshwater, never freezing lakes with areas around them that were uh, free of any snow. And in that film we show footage of the uh, Navy planes landing in these lakes. But even more so, he found uh, to his amazement that his planes were disappearing very quickly. A lot of his planes uh, were attacked by anti-gravity devices that were operated by the Germans there, by anti-gravity saucers. A lot of them crashed into invisible barriers and disintegrated in mid-flight. This is an indication that the Germans had already perfected the force field shields and they were up and operational around the German colony at Neuschwabenland. When he was retreating, basically the whole operation lasted for one week. They started in the, at the end of February 47 and by the first week of uh, March they were through with uh, the whole operation and much, much earlier than scheduled and they departed. And in an interview at Buenos Aires on his way back, Admiral Byrd uh, made the incredible statement that the Third World War would probably be with an adversary coming from the polar regions of our planet, an adversary that has the ability to fly unobstructed from pole to pole. He was referring to the Germans at their south polar colony at Neuschwabenland that were operating their um, anti-gravity craft with impunity and could fly circles around the globe and of course would shoot out of the sky any of the uh, attacking American planes. The mediums were said to have also received precise information about the civilizations on the inhabited planets situated around Alderbaran, and a one-way trip was scheduled to depart 
towards the Pleiades to reunite. The women of Vril eventually joined with the Thule Gesellschaft and other organizations set up by the German government in order to construct an anti-gravitic flight disc known as the Genzitz Flugmaschine. With substantial financial backing, the odd disc-shaped machines were successfully constructed in Munich and secretly tested for several years. Thule wanted to help develop both a production combat craft and a functional rhyme shift or spaceship. The Vril, by comparison, only wanted to develop the spaceship to reach Alderbaran and the Taurus constellation, Germany's successful development of functioning disc craft during the war, is now, in my opinion, well documented, which I've already covered in numerous videos with examples from World War II, such as the Battle over Los Angeles, Foo Fighters, and after the war and Operation High Jump, with incidents in Roswell and the 1952 UFO flyover Washington, D.C. In early 1943, the Nationalist Socialist embarked on the design of a cigar-shaped spaceship that was to be built in the workshop of the Zeppelin. It was the Andromeda apparatus and was designed to transport several spacecraft in a plate form for interstellar flights. When the Allies occupied Germany in early 1945, the British and the Americans discovered, among other things, the secret files of the SS, photos of the Hanabu 2 and Vril 1, as well as the Andromeda. In March 1946, President Truman gave the orders to collect the nationalist German material and to classify the technology as top secret. Russians also allegedly contain documents of these flying disks as well as maps to the Antarctic underground colony. German scientists working undercover were given false papers and sent to the U.S. as part of the framework of Operation Paperclip. Where do the Illuminati receive their knowledge? Well, I would use the famous uh, jokes and stories about Tesla and Edison. Uh, According to Edison, invention was 95% perspiration and 5% inspiration. According to Tesla, the way Tesla was doing his inventions, he would have 95% inspiration and probably 5% perspiration. Tesla would get a vision. All he has to do is put the vision into paper. Then he has to take the paper to the engineers to put it into metal in the shop little fine-tuning here and there and the device works. This is the usual mode through which information and know-how is channeled from the extraterrestrial and even higher levels of existence to our planet. The know-how is given and we are left to put it into our crude terrestrial engineering and manufacturing methods. That's why the crude anti-gravity saucers of the 1880s, 1890s were made with rivets. Uh, Giant cannons were used to fire the first anti-gravity devices toward the moon. Later on, in the early 1900s, more advanced technologies were used, but always the technology would follow up with our terrestrial one. Why are there two totally different scientific and engineering realities on the planet? Why the mass consumption engineering culture is 50 to 100 years behind the secret culture developed by the Illuminati? I have always had this very big question, very, very big puzzle in front of me. Uh, this is the Promethean dilemma for me. How come that with these incredibly good intentions to elevate the scientific and technological level of our civilization, we end up with the very negative and dismal results of all of these efforts. My feeling is that uh, basically that is the major mode through which the, should I call it the independent angelic presence on the planet is trying to uh, corrupt the scientific and the political minds of the elite of our planet with visions of grandeur with technologies that are too far ahead 
possibly for our spiritual and moral development and that are very dangerous that can explode any minute and basically uh, bring the end of our civilization as has happened for dozens of times on our same planet again information coming to us from many extraterrestrial revelations about previous illuminated efforts to speed up the evolution on the planet that ended up in very brutal uh, violent nuclear wars uh, the Illuminati have an agenda that would probably not be accepted in a normal, open voting system by the majority of the population on the planet. Meanwhile, Maria Orsic and the Vril Circle mysteriously disappeared, never to be heard from again, fueling speculation among some writers that Maria may have in fact escaped, as she claimed, to Alderbaran a recently published letter of departure to the young Vrilorinen, dated March 11, 1945, mentions the Odin departure. It refers to a temporary evacuation location with Maria and the final departure to Alderbaran. The letter ends, quote, No one is staying here, and is signed with cheerful courage by Godron. In Norse mythology, Godrin was the sister of Gunnar, both children of Guki, king of the Nibelungs. Sigrun, another Vril maiden, was one of the nine daughters of Odin. An alternative yet similar theory regarding the destination of the Odin departure postulates that the mission was not meant for the Alderbaran system, but instead for Mars. There are parts of a report of a kamikaze operation being a joint German-Japanese expedition in the Hanibu 3 to the planet Mars. A Hanibu 3 with a diameter of 71 meters is claimed to have enough power to travel the 75 million kilometers the distance from Earth to Mars. There is a 1945 report that the SS Department D4 decided to make this journey. This would have been a one-way trip unless they received help along the way or at the other end of the journey. In 1946, the Rockefeller Foundation paid $139,000 for the exclusive rights to the official public version report of the history of the Second World War, which concealed from the public the truth behind Admiral Byrd's mission to Antarctica immediately following World War II, a secret that has lasted as long as the cover-up concerning the events at Roswell. It was also silent about the mystical and occult ideology behind the nationalist socialist regime, including the Vril-inspired free energy technology, which was rumored to have been later perfected at the infamous Area 51. The major donor was Rockefeller's Standard Oil. We can see here some uh, quote, quote similarities with the American public education system. Uh, we can imagine the tremendous discrepancies between the special education the children of the elite get and the artificially watered down and moronized education that the general public in America is getting from the public schooling system. It is meant, we can understand obviously, to assure that these that are in control and in power would always remain in control and power and that very seldom, if really, a person must be really a genius, his soul must be the soul of a genius, in order to overcome the American education establishment, and despite the, <laughs> the education he is getting from there, uh, to be able to reach to the highest levels of, 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 of management and, 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 and um, science and technology in this country. So, I think this whole interview is in memory of your father, yes. what were his three names, his full three names? Friedrich August Kuppers, or Friedrich Wilhelm August Kuppers. Uh, in memory of uh, Diplom Engineer, Herr Diplom Engineer, Dr. Friedrich Wilge, w Wilhelm August Kuppers, as would his full German title be. Uh, 
may he live and work in 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 uh, in, in in peace and 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 fruitfully and we all will be following his life path uh do you have anything else as a final comment as a final remark before we conclude well, I uh, remember the last one of the comments that he made. He says it's not always what you see in life; it's what you don't see that's that is important. important. That's important. Yes. That's remember that it's not what we see that is the most important thing, and let's dig out deeper and try to discover for ourselves and for the whole civilization the real depth and magnitude and dimension of the secret government. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon as well as through various other major book outlets. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.